All right, guys, welcome to a special interview edition of Almost in Agreement. Um, I am rolling solo today with uh, our special guest, Grant Rosenberg. He is running for District 2 County Commission for Knoxville, uh, Knox County, sorry. Um, and District 2 includes like the Fountain City, Carnes. Uh, actually, give me the the, ma- the mental map there. Yeah, so if you start at the Broadway Central intersection, just north of downtown, mm-hmm. and you follow those corridors north, uh, and it kind of captures part of Inskip. So Fourth and Gill, Old North Knoxville, Oakwood Lincoln Park, all Ed- the, all the Edgewood, br- Fairmont Emerald, all North that Hills. Brewery Row there on Central <laughs> Brewery Row. And that's what it's uh, become. Yeah, absolutely, uh, uh, North Hills, uh, Fairmont Emerald, uh, Inskip, and then all of Fountain City. And it goes all the way out to Murphy Road, East Town Mall, okay. that whole area. So it's a pretty big. So what's the top end up in Fountain City? Just past Fountain City, like past the Duck Pond, but at the park area there, and then that's before about before it gets into officially halls. Once you hit that ridge, mm-hmm. the ridge is the is okay. the northern border of the district. Because Max Max Black, on the Black show, Oak ridge. right? Max on the show is from Halls, mm-hmm. and so you're not quite his district. Yep. Um, AC lives back right here behind me, so he's in my district, and then. Uh, Sam lives down across the river, so I think he's District 1. That'd be 9, probably. So. Is it 9? Well, it's, one's one's downtown, downtown, right? One is downtown in, e- in East Knoxville. Right. I get so confused. Like, this, that's part of the thing of the show. Like, you know, this is us actively trying to get better understanding of what's going on around us, and it's like I'm District 4, I'm District 18, um, I'm west uh, the the whole high school schooling zone systems like uh, like there's all these different little zoning things that are going on i am this far out of city i'm literally that fence that you can see out the window right now is city this is not and so like all this different stuff that that trying to just trying to get a list like i try to find my sample ballot coming up and like most of the time like the one that the news guys put out is it's the full ballot but it's it shows your district it shows all the districts that are up it's like well which one's me i forget and so it's trying to dig through all these different layers of of the system to try to be better for my household my family and my county and and that kind of stuff so let's start with a little like the 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 brief biography to get us to today so where are you from um, what'd you go to, where'd you go to school, that kind of stuff. And then what got you into the, doing this? Sure. No, great question. So, uh, I'm originally from Michigan, a, a town, Michigander, uh, Michigander, about 25 miles North of Detroit a town called Rochester. Okay. So uh, you're a Lions fan. That sucks. Uh, unfortunately, yes, I'm a Lions <laughs> fan. I, I, although I've, I've decided not to subject my children to that. So they, they have free, uh, free agency. We were talking about the paper bag years a couple episodes ago. <laughs> There's ever seems like it's every, it's every year. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I grew up in Michigan, Detroit area, uh, graduated high school, came down to UT okay. to go to college. So that's what brought me to Knoxville, Knox County was what year, when did you start at UT? 98. Okay. I mean, I was there too. I started in 2000. So it's a good year to start. I'm not that far behind you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I got the, I, yeah, I got the way down the hill it was my, I was, we were band, me and the wife were, we were band kids and we got not as, uh, we didn't have anywhere near the cool bull trips and stuff like that, that the band kids prior to us had. Yeah. All right, so undergrad. So you went to UT Knoxville and undergrad at UT. I uh, didn't know really want to what I wanted to be when I grew up. So I, I was a journalism major and a business minor. Uh, got an internship. Uh, I did several internships to figure out what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do. I was going into my senior year and got an, an internship for school credit, working for county executive at the time, Mike Ragsdale. He had just been elected and uh, showed up his first day in office and just offered to do whatever. They wanted me to want whatever they, they needed done, uh, and I uh, was just going to earn school credit. I wanted to learn about government. I had no idea what a county executive was. It soon became county mayor. They renamed right. the office. Uh, but anyway, in turn there, my, my fall semester, my spring semester, they paid me $7 an hour. They kept me on as an intern, uh, and then I, I was about to graduate, and they offered me an opportunity to, to join the administration. I started the Office of Neighborhoods. For Knox County. This was before there was a city office neighborhoods, before there was a 311 system. Okay. So my first job was literally, it, it, this was kind of a customer service department for county government. Right. This why, why it was created. So my first job was literally answering 215 help line. And I, and, and right. I just answered complaints, uh, complaints ranging from dirty lots to animal control to you know, city issues, state issues, federal issues. 
uh, really just became a conduit. Put a pin in it. The dirty lot thing is a serious question that that Max. I'm going to ask on Max's behalf later, but it's 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 dumb. But I, we're, I'm going to ask it. I'll get to Continue. that. In, I'll get to that in a minute. I'm okay. happy to talk about. it. I'm pretty well versed in it. So <laughs> I, I uh, ran the office of neighborhoods. You know, went to neighborhood meetings, met with neighborhood groups. Uh, just kind of that conduit between citizens and government, educating folks about local government and county government in particular. I uh, did that for a few years, ended up becoming director of that department. And then after a few more years, we uh, saw that we were having a backlog of code issues, right. dirty lot complaints, zoning complaints, a big backlog of those. So I brought that to the mayor's attention and uh, they said, okay, well, we're going to put that department under you. So okay. I'm, in, I'm in my mid twenties and I'm, I'm managing office neighborhoods and now managing zoning and code enforcement, uh, which is a, you know, just a big opportunity, really. Right, uh, right. A big responsibility, but a very big opportunity at a very young age and learned a lot doing that. So I uh, took over that department and we did some good things, made some some administrative changes, made some legislative changes to, to make our officer's job a little easier, make the process a little smoother. Um, uh, ran that department for several years, ran, uh, staff for the Board of Zoning Appeals for the county. And then uh, a few years after that, I, uh, I we were co- co-located on the third floor with the Office of Community Development, which oversees all the state, federal, and local grant funds and housing funds and uh, homeland security funds and just a lot of alphabet soup of right. of, uh, of federal grants and state grants. Uh, so how much of those offices are dependent on external funds as for, or are they completely external funds? Is Community development uh, was a mix. Now, okay. d- uh, code and zoning enforcement is all local funded, locally funded, and office neighbors locally funded. Right. Uh, community development department. So I took over, I, t- I ended up taking over that department as well. So I was over three departments uh, towards the latter end of the Ragsdale administration. But community development, I really learned a lot uh, in that in that realm. Uh, we, uh, we managed a lot of the federal housing funds, HUD funds, so mm-hmm. CDBG and HOME and affordable housing initiative, permanent supportive housing for chronically homeless, working with a lot of social service agencies. But we also had local funds that we, we gave to local local organizations, nonprofit organizations. We had a grant, a grants uh, uh, program. So get grants, give grants. Yeah, that's right. Check, got it. Yeah, so uh, did that for, for a few years. And then uh, Mayor Burchett took over as, as county mayor. Mm-hmm. Uh, they moved the, uh, they restructured the code and zoning back under, moved it back under engineering public works. They moved the office neighborhoods kind of back into the mayor's office as constituent service department. And I stayed on as community development director, got more involved in the redevelopment and the TIFs and the pilots and the downtown and right. surplus properties throughout the county, the county owned that we were trying right. to dispose of. And then of course the housing funds as well. So I did that. Uh, anyway, that was a 10 year, 10 year career. I'll, I'll speed up the story. No, a you're fine. It's a it's 10, 10 year career at, at, in county government. Uh, at that point, uh, two years under the Birch administration, decided to go back to school, get my MBA, mm-hmm. and uh, left to go join the private sector. I worked for a nonprofit called Knoxville Leadership Foundation. I managed all their housing programs. So I managed Neighborhood Housing with, uh, Incorporated, which built single family homes for uh, first time home buyers. Okay. And then we managed Southeastern Housing Foundation, which developed and acquired uh, multifamily projects, particularly LIHTC, Low Income Housing Tax Credit projects. Okay. They were the developer on Minvilla Manor and Flanagan Landing in South Knox, okay. which is permanent supportive housing for chronically homeless. Uh, so I did that for two years and then uh, was recruited over to join the executive team at Denark Construction. And okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm an executive there, <clears throat> vice president of business development, been there for the last six years. So that's my career up to, up to today. Uh, my first house... Uh, when I graduated college, was in Oakwood Lincoln Park, okay. behind uh, St. Mary's. Bought a house there, fixed it up, and then my next house was over in Old North Knoxville, a hundred-year-old house that right. we fixed up and renovated, and then met my wife. We lived over there, uh, just behind the post office for a few years, right uh, next to Bell Camp. Yeah, yeah, we lived we lived right near Bell Camp. That was our first. Or Bell Morris. Or Bell Morris. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, yeah, we lived off uh, right off of like we could hear the school bell in the morning that close. Um, Washing bike for a couple of years when we first. Uh, started living together after we moved out of the dorms and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I, my, with my wife, we bought a house on Scott Avenue, a big Victorian house in old North renovated mm-hmm. that. And then uh, about five years ago, we had our second kid and we wanted a little more space, uh, an extra bedroom. It's hard mm-hmm. to add on to a 120 year old house. <laughs> For sure. So we bought a house in Fountain city. We live in Harold Hills, renovated a, a, okay. new, a newer house. It was built in the late thirties. And now you got a Chick-fil-A. So all is good. <laughs> That's right. We have a Chick-fil-A. I mean, that you can never get to because it's always 
packed around the block, but yeah. that's Chick-fil-A for you. So that brings me today. Yeah. And that's, and that's kind of, you know, I'm running, uh, the opportunity presented itself, uh, given my background in, right. in local government. Uh, right, so you're not new to, <clears throat> you're not new to government, but you're new to politics. Not new to government and not really new to politics, but I'm new. I'm new to being a candidate. Okay, so, right, that's right. That's what I'm, I'm. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things I tell people. I'm, I feel very prepared to 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 serve and do this job, um, but I've had to get prepared to be a, a candidate and put yourself out there as a political candidate. Okay, and so, um, so the what what so again, like I said, we we're trying to figure out some of the processes as well as the people. Um, so who is is um, I I lost her name anyway there's not an incumbent right now right correct the, so. the current commissioner is michelle carringer okay she currently <clears throat> holds the seat now she's running for uh state house okay house of representatives up yeah. in fountain city powell halls area and okay. uh, she's running the primary this august as well but she, so it's an open seat okay so both that, my opponent and myself are, are that's what she's about and so um i guess for a little bit of history of the district for me because i didn't pay that much attention when i did live up there um is it generally a, a, a Democrat or Republican district? It is a very split district, actually. Okay. It's been represented by, uh, I mean, Madeline Rojero, who's the that was who, became, who okay. became city mayor. That yeah. was her first elected job. Uh, India Kincannon represented this district on huh. school board. Uh, the current, you know, Michelle Carringer's a Republican. Before that, it was Amy Broyles and Mark Harmon. They were Democrats. Before okay. that, was David Collins, who was a Republican. Okay. So it's it's gone back and forth. It's a very uh, I don't want to say it's 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 a relatively diverse district. It is politi- yeah, very sure. politically mm-hmm. diverse district. Very different, very urban neighborhoods, very suburban areas, and then right. some rural areas as well. Yeah. So, it's a it's a good mix. Um, and that's you know that's kind of how I am. I feel, yeah. I feel like I'm pretty so, nonpartisan, so it, I fit fit pretty well with the demographics. So just because it came to mind as we were talking about it, is like so. What are you, what are your thoughts on the the new uh, police? I can't remember what the word is. The Justice Center or whatever taking over St. Mary's. That's a that's a city proposal, right? Um, I mean, it's still in your district. Though. It you is my to, district. Uh, yeah, very big. <clears throat> uh, I'm supportive of it overall. I think it's a good it's a good reuse of that property. Obviously, right. um, you know, unfortunately, I mean, ideally, the hospital would have stayed and, right. and renovated, fixed up, and, and kept kept a hospital in our district. There right. aren't, there aren't, I'm not sure there's any hospitals in the city of Knoxville anymore, uh, right now. So that's. I mean, we got the Fort Sanders down. Besides, I'm sorry. Besides Fort Sanders, okay. outside of Fort Sanders, you're right. But in uh, uh, anyway. We, Ideally, we would have kept kept the hospital. Right. Uh, I mean, Mary's, both my kids. Stayed. We had both our kids there. So, yeah, us I mean, too. It's a bummer for me. <laughs> like I was like, oh, that's how our kids are doing well. Yeah. So you know, in the absence of that, uh, I think it's a good. It's a you're getting a good public sector sector anchor tenant right. there on the site. So you're getting the buildings, uh, some of those buildings reused, and then the the northern half of that property will hopefully get redeveloped uh, by the private sector. Hopefully, some housing, right. some redevelopment, some some housing comes in that area, some density. I mean, that, that section of town is definitely growing currently um, between like I was joking earlier about the, the, the brewery row that's that central is turning into and all, and how that, how much that has grown. Like I remember when, you know, I mean, I, like when I lived up there, you didn't go over there unless you had to go through there. Mm-hmm. Like I was not, there was nothing to do there. It wasn't like a scary thing. It was just that there was nothing there. Yeah. And that, at least not that normal people use unless you had like, you needed carpet or like the three other businesses that have been there for like a hundred years. Um, you know, and then um, Fountain City also at the same time because our second house together was up a, right next to uh, Central High School. Mm-hmm. So also heard that bell and heard the band on, on Friday nights and stuff like that. Um, you know, I mean, then and, and I don't know if it was all the Kroger, but when that Kroger took over that Target, that whole section just went mm-hmm. and, and exploded. So there is a lot of growth going on in there. And so for again, because we, we joke on the show all the time about how weird the city county lines are and where they cross. All of Broadway is city, right? All the way up to the Duck Pond. Yes. So all that in there. What like so? How much? This uh, this is so confusing to me. So how much of your district is city? Uh, I'd say almost eighty percent of my district okay. is city. It's, it's majority city. And so how does like that that confuses me? Like how does that work? That because there is a, a a you're the county you, you would be the county commissioner and then there is a. Um, whatever the city's version is. It's city a council. city council. There's the word I was looking for mm-hmm. that are essentially sitting over the same section of town, having talking to different bodies about what they want to do with that, like what things are going on. And like that, I don't know. I accidentally got onto the Metro idea with Kyle Ward and I'm really, mm-hmm. really hot on that idea. And I'm 
debating on how hard I want to push that. But like that confuses me. And like, yeah. how, how does that functionally work when it's like yeah. you, because it's the same people, it's the same constituents. It, and so you're hearing from people that, that this thing, like they don't want that development going up over there. But then the city person's hearing from their group of people, which is the same group of people that they do want it there. But the, but the responsibilities don't overlap. Okay. So that's the, that's the difference. Okay. Uh, we have different, the city oversees a very different set of functions in the county. Okay. There's some overlap. You know, you talk about Metro and I'm happy to talk about that. I used to be, a, I used to be pro Metro and I've, I've come back around on that actually. And I'll tell you why the really big stuff, the big government services right now that, that we consume directly or indirectly right. have already been, have already been consolidated. Right. Cause was, yeah. Cause I was talking to the guys that, uh, when I was talking to the public defender guys, essentially, Unless it's like tickets and little piddly stuff, all criminal activity in Knoxville goes through the county courts. And jail. Um, right. And, and which again, but that it's so confusing to me. So then why do we have a KPD and a sheriff's office when they essentially run and operate for all intents and purposes as one office? I would assume they have like some sort of liaison BS that they have to pass certain paperwork to each other for certain specific things. But it just seems like a, it seems like there's, it's a redundancy, not in maybe total numbers, if we're going to stay on the police version of it. I mean, the total numbers might be right for the volume we have, but management, but management and, and the bureaucracy side of it, we have two layers of that. And those are usually the more expensive people in the, in the programming um, that are getting paid twice, essentially. Yeah, there, there's probably some redundancy there. I, w I won't argue that. But again, the, the majority of the sheriff's budget, for example, is our jail. Right is is running our our justice system is running our jail. It's not. I mean, the patrol is a big piece too, and those are obviously you know they patrol neighborhoods outside of city limits. KPD patrols inside, but the or jail. Both, no I get, I, the last time last time I saw a police officer in the neighborhood of the city, even though we're county, but whatever. Sure. <laughs> well, they may live out here. Um, right, it's but, true. <laughs> uh, um, but the uh, you know the the big the big the big ticket is the jail is our jail. That's our okay. biggest ticket item uh, outside of our school system. So schools is the biggest thing. Right, but the, half a billion dollars is we have one one county school system, no city school. And I think that's great. But like, and the more I've the more I've learned about that too is it seems to me like they're their own entity anyway. They don't really answer to except for budget approval. Well, budget funding, yeah. I mean, the, they rely on commission. Commission has all the funding responsibility for the schools, but none of the policy authority. Okay. So school board has policy authority, but none of the funding responsibility. County commission has all the funding responsibility. But none of the. None okay, of the so that's her because I think, I think when I was talking to Kyle about it, we like it. I don't remember. Maybe it was Todd. I don't know. So we were talking about it, and it, 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 it at least the impression I got was that, um, of the total income that the county gets from sales tax, sixty percent of that is automatically schools. So if sixty percent of that is automatically schools, then what is the commission actually approving if? They don't have a choice if, you know, if we collect a hundred dollars, sixty. That's the school boards. What is the commission actually approving in that budget? If other than to say, all right, you're at or below sixty dollars, and that's as much as you're allowed to have. There's property taxes that go to schools as well. Is it okay? Yeah. But either way, you know what I'm saying though, as far as like if because we're roughly a billion dollar budget, six hundred million of that is automatically in the schools. The way is, is at least the way I understand it. Or maybe I'm, maybe I'm misunderstanding. Uh, there so. Sales tax, right? You're correct. I mean, the, the sales tax that's collected, uh, both at a local level and collected by the state, and then given back to us. Yeah, we through, know all about, through I'm, some magic formula. Right, I know all about uh, that. Yes, that yeah, that doesn't change. That that is kind of set in by formula, but there's a there's also a local portion that we put in through our our property taxes through the county's property okay. tax that goes to schools. Absolutely, and that's up to that's up to commission to approve all of it. Okay, but. Overall. Firing firing Bob Thomas is on my list of things that you need to do. We don't we don't we don't have a, I know that's what everybody that, else. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not something we uh, that's not in our yeah in, well, our, and uh, in our lane. I, I saw there speak. was a, I don't know if you saw it this morning. There was kind of a leak of what we are anticipating getting told is what's going on later tonight. Huh. Um, they're gonna the way it, it reads to me is that there's as a, as parents we have two options. We can send them to school and then it's mass and cleaning and uh, the. Uh, they're push back the start date. You can send them to school or you can essentially homeschool with the assistance of whatever online format they put in, in place. Um, uh, mask and some other stuff. I'd have to pull it back up to get this more specific on. I'm waiting to, uh, I'm waiting to, to see that whole thing. I'm curious about all that. Cause I got two running around upstairs mm -hmm. that, um, 
I, I started, when I started school, I started thinking I wanted to be a teacher and I really quickly learned that I was just not who I am. And the idea of trying to homeschool my kids when I'm fortunate enough to be working two jobs and doing this podcast doesn't sound fun to me at all mm-hmm. um, or beneficial to me or the kids for that matter. So the, the what's going on with schools, I'm very interested in, but that kind of kicked us off topic. But it's okay. Um, so... Th- so the, I mean, obviously the the school board is the biggest chunk of our total budget. Um, I don't, I, I don't know. We can go down the metro thing. There's four things, four four big services. Okay, yeah. I'll finish talking about. So yeah, yeah. schools number one. Our justice system and our jails number two. Number three is our health department. Okay. There's no city health department. It's all county health department. Okay. And then library system. All right. So those are four major, big systems that are are already consolidated. They're already metro. Uh, now, I, I think you, there's other departments, there's other things you could consolidate uh, that I'm you know, open to open suggestions on. The police, the police piece, I think, is, 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 kind is of, difficult from a political standpoint because right. our sheriff is an elected individual and our uh, police chief is appointed. So right. that's, a, that's a unique argument that I don't, I don't think realistically will happen politically. Right. Um, our parks and recreation, you know, we could have a metro park system. Right. No, no reason we couldn't do that. I don't think this, but I don't think the savings are what are what everyone thinks they would be. Okay, because that's, uh, that's that's mainly my yeah. stance on it. Is it sounds like it's yeah. a lot of extra money? Because like, yeah, you know, again, because like, like, you know, so you were saying that you know your eighty something percent of your district is in city as well, and so the but you have different obligation. So what is some what is what is an obligation that you don't have that the city does? that you don't get input on as the county commissioner versus that city council member? Um, the only things would be, I guess, maybe rezonings in the city limits. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't, I don't have any, I don't have a vote on. Right. Uh, but, you know, the other services provided by the city are, you know, the police, your, your police and fire, your trash pickup and your brush pickup. And then downtown projects like like the KPD headquarters at, at Saint, the St. Saint Mary's site. Right. The county probably won't have a whole lot to do with those city projects. However, you know, we work in partnership with the city on a lot of projects. So, you know, the redevelopment on the northern portion, that would probably require some tax incentives that have to go through county commission and city council. So TIFs and pilots, tax increment right. financing, payment loop taxes, those have to go through, usually have to go through both legislative bodies. So it requires a, an aura of, an aura of cooperation between the two bodies. And that's something I, I, I bring to the table, having relationships right. on, on both sides. But, you know, overall, my platform, and this is my argument, will be my argument if I'm elected to my colleagues on county commission is we're growing we're growing as a county we're growing as a region and for us to have a strong county we have to have a strong city right we can't have a strong county without a strong city so and and if we can focus our growth from the inside out i think that's a good growth policy particularly on uh, from a fiscal standpoint right as the county so expand on that like what is what do you mean what do you mean by inside out so redevelopment, obviously redevelopment downtown has been great, but continuing to see redevelopment along north, the North Central Corridor, I want to see that continue. Okay. I want to see continue development along North Broadway. Okay. Uh, East Town Mall is a huge piece of property that needs to be redeveloped at some point. Hopefully, you we know, went to that we, auction. That was fun. It was weird. We went into that auction. We got to <laughs> yeah. walk around in there when yeah. it was empty. Oh, it was, it was, oh yeah. it was fun. So, you know, but that's 90 acres of real of, of interstate access that needs to be redeveloped. I'd rather redevelop that than have to go build a new business park somewhere else. Right. It, it, stretch, it stretches our resources. It stretches our infrastructure. Right. Because that's um, one of the things about Knoxville to Knox County that's so weird is Knoxville is so stretchy. It, and it used to be all east-west, and now we're going north and a little bit south. The south side's still a, a major... I, I I'm I'm still not sure how much I believe in the Southside project really bringing around what what the plan is. I don't see like I think putting apartment complexes in there targeted at students is a weird idea. I'd much rather seen that had been more of a single family, um, maybe young professionals target as as opposed to the student target. But I mean both those apartment complexes are selling hard to students, mm-hmm. and I don't understand that. I think the Regal thing down there is cool, but. In hindsight, not knowing the pandemic was coming, that might not have been the best thing to to, to push. Um, plus, I mean, um, our business is in Powell, and so to me, it's like, well, we we just brought a county into the city, so I guess it does have some tax incentive. It's not like bringing out an outside business, sure. you know. Like I'm big. I argue, especially with um, one of my buddy's dads, who was a union guy from old. I argue with him to death about tax incentives for to import business. I think that's an important thing that government can do to help. The populace and like that regal one just doesn't make sense to me because where's the tax like 
you're just giving somebody that's already here the tax incentive instead of bringing somebody from outside. But could they have gone somewhere else? They could have, and they would have. The, and yeah, I've heard, yeah, and I'd heard that part of it too. And that's you know that's behind the scenes stuff that that we don't know yeah. about, which is one of the things I don't like as a as a constituent. I don't sure. like to. I, I don't. I don't like that. Um, you know, I, I, I part of me I don't like that Regal played that card. I think that's that's kind of shitty. Pardon the language, but I mean that's we are an explicit podcast, but whatever. Um, I just think that's. Um, but it is part of the game, and I get it because there was. I'm sure there was some other Louisville might have been like, or Lexington might have been like, "Hey, come on." Well, you we also have to think about it too. What what it, the incentives that were put put on the table? Mm -hmm. You got to remember with tax increment financing, it's there's the, the city and county aren't coming out of pocket. Right. It's just it's just it's a it's a tax abatement. Right. So we're not getting the revenue. Right. We're deferring the revenue, but the absence of that, we weren't getting any revenue anyway. It's a vacant right. building. Right. I guess so. Yeah, sure. So you're you're, you're your net loss or gain, you're, you're not. There's no net loss, right? And there's only net gain in terms of jobs downtown, keeping keeping Regal here, keeping a corporate headquarters downtown in, right. in a consolidated building. And it's fun to have a signature building. Down so there there's these ancillary things we have to, you know, and, and there there is a public. I mean, there is a test. To ha there has to be a public benefit. There has to be a but for, uh, which means you know this project would not happen but for this incentive, right? A project wouldn't happen but for that incentive. So right. whether whether it's Regal going in or whether it's an out of town firm, the, right. the difference to that building on its own is the same. You're getting uh, uh, you're getting a building re redeveloped. Right, and the county didn't lose the county didn't lose Regal, and we got. I, I mean, I get it. I, I, it's just yeah, but then the pandemic is really putting the hammer to that. Well, yeah, anyway, yeah. But obviously, in hindsight, nobody yeah, knew, no, no right. one could have known that, and no yeah. one could have known they would have been acquired by another firm too. Right. You know, that's the other threat too is that they, they've been acquired by an outside firm so yeah. none of the leadership that that agreed to the deal are there anymore so is there i mean there is there a stipulation in place for that or yeah, is there we just kind of got to pay back the loan so i mean it's worth the city the, the county's fine the county and city are protected in that okay. deal um and the building got redeveloped i mean could could regal leave absolutely but they got to they're they're on the hook for paying back right the and tip. then the building's there and then and remember the tiff is a loan we get the loan that gets paid back okay does the um just I, I, it doesn't matter. But does the city own that building, or is that is there a private, or is that Regal own that building? I don't know, that's... They own the building, but the, the 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 deal with the pilot, the payment in lieu of taxes, the or I think it's it's either pilot or TIF. I can't remember which one it is. Right. It's I think it's a ten million dollar loan that they have to it has to be paid back. So okay. I, the city the, the 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 municipality gets protected in these deals and the redevelopment incentives. Okay. I'm uh, cool. The way I'm it's structured. I'm, it's, right. Uh, I'm I'm totally cool with it. I just like I mean I'm just always curious about like. You know, I mean, uh, th there's always you always hear the stories about some business doing some shady turnaround and 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 vacating or whatever, and yeah. and the the public is left holding the bag, and and I'm sure it could still happen from time to time, but you know, those are the questions that come to mind when these things start kind of popping up that I don't have I don't have the insight to have the answers to um, generally, and I like to be able to add that to my arsenal when I'm arguing with you know I think people. there's risk you know there there's risk that revolves around any decision and any deal in the public sector and of course in the private sector. And it's just a matter of you know identifying those risks and, and then trying to manage those risks, and mitigating those risks. Right. Uh, but keep in mind though, we have to take risk. Right. Uh, both in the private and in the public sector, we have to take risk. For sure. Uh, without risk, there is no yeah. growth, redevelopment. There's no reward. Right. For for uh, uh, not that it matters, but we're we're working on our second store. We're about to open our second store, and it's like mm, I mean you know we don't know what's going on. Yeah. I'm uh, my biggest fear right now is come August one when um, all the bonus unemployment runs out that all of our customer base that has had enough income to function no longer has the income to function. And then we're going to be all our, all our growth that we've had through this because people had the funds available just disappears because everybody's broke again. Um, and I'm, I mean, I, we, we, good God, we, like I said, we were on episode 18, 20, something like that. And we started accidentally with the pandemic and all we end up doing is talking about it. Mm -hmm. And for, 20 weeks now we still don't know anything and we still can't figure out what's going on and we have a a, a, a fairly well-informed medical professional that's part of the show and he you know he's he i mean as far as the medical side he's good with it but as far as where we go moving forward and i mean you know because everybody we've talked to all the different um uh candidates that we've talked to it's all budget that's everybody's that's all everybody like what's the first thing you do when you take the job we're going to be digging into this budget we've got to figure out this budget mm -hmm. this budget is number one a um, you know, and then it's, you know, like we've had some that are, you know, we, that, that a property tax increase may be the solution, um, or we got to cut funding somewhere else. And those are the questions. Um, I guess that'd be the general question. Where do you lean on that? You know, if, if, is, is it, is, is it 
budget cuts or is it tax increase to get a budget through? Well, you know, the question is where do the cuts come from? Right. Uh, I mean, is it is it is given uh, given financial given the economy given the situation we're in? You know, is it a good time to cut back on to cut teachers? Right. Is it a good time to cut resources to our schools to, to cut funds to our health department to to cut our public services? Um, I would argue it probably is not a good time to be, to be cutting things. Of course, is it a good time to raise taxes? It's never a good time to raise taxes either. Right. And I mean, that, and um, some people it might be the worst time to raise taxes. And so you know, you 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 try to get gather as much information as you can, identify where the, what the risks are in, in that in the decision we're making, and and you know, make the best decision you can that's that's right for the long term. And uh, I'm I'm not opposed to a tax increase. It's something. And we haven't had one in 21 years. That doesn't mean we, we should have one just because we haven't had right. one in a while. But our tax rate's gone down a lot. It's gone down down $1.20 since we raised it 55 cents in 99. Right, on the property so tax rate. The rate's gone down. Uh, you know, we, 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 we have low taxes. We need to have low taxes. It's, a, it's a, well, an part attractive of the, thing. But we also, we also get what we pay for. We need to make sure we're making – we need to be thinking about some of the – some of the services we provide, right? We need to be start starting to think of them less as cost centers and more as investments. And we invest in education. There's a return on that investment. We, you know, what draws companies here? We were just talking about pilots and tiffs a little bit ago, right? Uh, every community offers tax incentives. Right. Every single community in the U.S. in the world offers these, you know, free land tax incentives, money. But the number one decision made by these these site selection consultants and these companies their number one reason to locate to a community is the workforce. Right. They've got, we got to have the workforce. We got to have the skilled workforce. And where does that start? It starts with our educa- our K-12 education system and then our post-secondary education system, our training, our TCATs, our uh, Pellissippi States, our UT, our Oak Ridge right. National Lab, all of those things. But we, it starts, you know, for us in our lane in County Commission, we, we've got to have a, a great school system. You know, if I want to grow, as I was getting back to my platform of growing from the inside out, mm-hmm. yeah. our inner city schools have to be outstanding schools. And we have some outstanding schools in our inner city. The LNN STEM is, right. one of the, you know, is one of the best schools in the county, in the state. Um, Beaumont Magnet Academy, great school in an, in an economically distressed community. It's a good model. Right. You know, it's a, it's a model I want to see replicated throughout our city. Our community schools program that brings you know makes our schools community schools. It's a program I'm very supportive of. I want to see us put more resources into that program. We've got to have great schools. It's the number one reason somebody chooses to move, especially those with families, to, to live in a neighborhood. It's the school system. It's right. the number one driver. Um, so we got to have great schools, and that's how we grow. Our, you know, There's one thing to be a low-cost community. Okay. So real quick, we need to be a high value community. So I'm getting the impression I may be wrong on this is that when the county discusses a tax increase, it's only a property tax conversation that is, does the county have the ability to, to tinker with the sales tax or is it only the, we do, we have another uh, 50 cents we can raise on our sales tax. So we, you know, we're not, we're at nine, two, five, we can go up to nine, seven, five. Okay. Um, and that's, that's an option. It's an option worth discussing. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's sales tax more regressive than property tax, so you know it, it can it, it can adversely impact uh, you know poorer folks. Uh, but at the same time, property tax increase it trickles down. I mean, don't pretend it doesn't. If you right. raise taxes on landlords, right. they're going to pass those costs along to. Because well, I'm thinking, yeah, because I'm thinking that, and especially given the the current state of of the economy and everything that's going on, either one's not going to perform particularly well. But I would think, uh, I don't know, I would think you're a property tax increase is going to be more um, likely to succeed as far as getting you a number, getting you a known number, I guess, for lack of a better word, like the, the, uh, politically, I think the property tax is harder to sell. I I agree with that. Um, But as far as, you know, if we raise it X number of dollars, it's going to produce X number. It's more reliable. Yeah. Sales tax is more variable cost. There's There's more, more variable revenue, right? You know, so yeah, when the pandemic hit our sales tax revenues took a dive, um, and there's you know there's other things to look at that the, at the states looking at with online sale you know looking at right and so I mean and again, like some of the things I'm always curious about is like I mean how much how much outside taxes are problematic that we have any uh, that we have no ability to do anything about um, you know because what is it's the the county is the six percent and then the state's the three and a quarter of the nine or I can't remember how that split state is seven. 
State of seven, we're two and a quarter. Five on groceries, and then, yeah, we're two and, two and a quarter. Okay. Local option. City's also two and a quarter. Uh, town of Farragut is two and a quarter. Okay, so Farragut doesn't give as much of that to schools. That's the that was the that's one thing. Farragut could give more more of their. That's a whole separate. That's, that's a whole other s- argument. I, I won't, we won't go. Yeah, there. that's a whole like not whole, our decision. Yeah. Well, the so. whole the whole entity of of Farragut is a is a it's standalone township. It's so weird to me, right. but that's that's neither here nor there. Um, but. I don't know. Like I'm just I don't know. I'm thinking out loud about how how to generate more revenue. Well, when I worked um, for the Ragsdale administration, you know, we raised the, raised the wheel tax. Uh, mm-hmm. Sorry, your your registration tags. They were twenty. It was twenty four dollars. Right. And I started. And, you know, we, we raised them six dollars in year one, and then raised another thirty in year two to sixty dollars. Right. And it was controversial. It went on the ballot. I remember that. People yeah. were fired up about it, um, which I, we thought was a pretty modest way to raise revenue without having to raise raise sales or or property right. tax. Um, so that's something there, but it doesn't raise it. You know, I think our wheel tax, $36, I think raises 15 million, 12, $15 million a year, something like that. That's it. I figure we had, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know how many cars we have registered in Knox County. I feel like it's a lot. I, I, I drive around this town enough to think that there's, yeah. there's a couple million cars for the half a million people we have here. At least it seems that way. <laughs> it may seem that way. Yeah, I'll tell you what, know. if we could figure out how to do, uh, if we could do some sort of um, specialty tax on truckers that are driving through, that'd be fantastic. Well, it's called the gas tax. We yeah, do. but they don't stop in gas here on purpose <laughs> for that reason. Well, the state the state levies the gas tax pays for our roads. Yeah, uh, well, and we do city and county collects collects gas tax pays for local roads. Right. The inter- interstate is funded through state gas tax. Uh, gas tax. Yeah, because I know that which was I'm, just uh, raised. Right, diesel especially has got a whole bunch of stuff on it. Yeah, a lot more than regular unleaded. But either way, um, okay. So you know we've talked about. Um, I don't know. I. I, I like I said, this is kind of free form. Yeah. I don't have a. I didn't come with a set of questions. I'm going to take a little bit of notes on yours to make sure we talk about it with your opponent um, mm-hmm. later. That sure. uh, that there's not a topic that you touch yeah. and she doesn't or whatever. But that's. But I don't know. I mean, you well, get the bonus of being first. Is that you kind of yeah. get to run the show for me? <laughs> well, another another big issue. I'm talking about issues in the city, right? So education is a big one. Growth and land use. You know, planning. I'm a big. I'm a. I'm a proponent of planning. Uh, we have to have good planning because it's how we. How we how we can accommodate infrastructure as it relates to growth because growth for the sake of growth right it's from a from a long term perspective because you end up growth. being like we are out here where we can't handle the traffic on a piece of road right. and they're trying to put a seven one hundred and twenty seven unit debacle down the street and we've been in a big fight well it's hard it's hard to do infrastructure after the fact right, right? you want to have that in place before the development comes right. and it's a chicken or egg argument but I, I think making that's why again I, I think in the city redevelopment it's such a low hanging fruit for the county because the infrastructure is in place, the transportation infrastructure is in place, the stormwater infrastructure, the schools aren't overcrowded, the services, the neighborhood services are provided by the city. So the property tax revenue to the county, that's just net growth to the, to the county's tax base. It right. grows our tax base without costing as much as growth that's occurring outside our municipal uh, boundaries. So, right. you know, I'm, yeah, very much in running a very pro urban campaign, and that's nothing. That's not that's not to the detriment of other districts. I, I think it's to the benefit of other districts because it grows our base, our tax base, without costing so much right. in in uh, in in growth and in redevelopment and, or growth in uh, infrastructure in terms of roads and schools and, and we just you know county commission just approved purchase of land last month uh, and building a new uh, new elementary school in Northwest Knox County. I mean. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. like my it's brother, of dollars. my brother lives out in Chodo, and he's got kids at uh, Farragut, mm-hmm. uh, not Farragut, uh, North Shore Elementary, and they were overcrowded the day they opened. Yeah, and yeah. it's like we, you know, <laughs> our, our company built Hardin Valley Middle School, and you know, it's it's, yeah. it's full. I mean, it's full, brand new school, yeah, thirty five well, million dollars school. I got my kids over here at Rocky Hill and yeah. in trailers in the back because that's what we got to do. Yeah. Um, uh, but the other issue that's that's a city issue that that's well that's perceived as a city issue, but I see it very much as a county issue is the issue of of chronic homelessness. Mm-hmm. Uh, while it's an issue that seems to be concentrated in the city, physically in the city, uh, although I will say there's camps all over right. all over our region, all over our county, but uh, it's very much a county issue because we're we're bearing most of the cost burden. Right. For these issues through our our jail and our justice system, but also in our emergency rooms through our indigent care contract, yeah, yeah. millions of dollars a year towards 
so, so, I won't even call them solutions. They don't work. They're you know they're they're band aids. Right. You know, ha- housing somebody, housing a mentally ill person in jail, or a chronic homeless, a chronically homeless person in our jail, isn't getting them better. Right. They're not leaving jail better than they came in. Right. It, uh, so you know we have the safety center, uh, which is a five day you know diversion from jail, which is good, and it's hope I think it seems to be working. Let's continue continue seeing that uh, evolve. But there's also, I think there's a missing piece for an inpatient mental health facility mm-hmm. here in our region. You know, Lakeshore Park, you know, is a great asset to our community. It's a great, beautiful park, but it used to be a mental health right. institution. Which I always thought was down. funny because it's like, let's put a, let's, let's, let's put a, a crazy person in a room and then walk in circles around them and see what happens. <laughs> I always thought that because, like, yeah, I, uh, I actually had a friend that, that worked there when we were, yeah. what, like in the last couple of years it was there. Um, so that we need, to, we need to work with our state and our federal you know, partners and, and the county needs to come to the table. You know, we all need to come to the table and, and find a way to bring something like that to our area, bring bring more beds mm-hmm. for inpatient mental health services. So that, that's all, one of those ones that like the automatically I'm like, well, that's great, except I don't want it here. You know, and so that's that's one of those like, you know, I, 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 there's nothing about that I, that I disagree with until the conversation about placement. Sure. Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is. I'm not trying to propose an answer. I just, I just, it just pops in my head and that's what I say out loud. It's there's, uh, you know, there's a variety of places they could, it could go. It, it's, I mean, we're talking about an institutional type of building. So I don't, I don't think it's smart to put something like that in the middle of a residential, right. you know, neighborhood out here. Probably I didn't mean but, here, me, but I something, the Royal, yeah, there's the, me. there's the NIMBY argument. I will say this, you know, I went through a lot of fights when I worked for the County and then after I left the County as well. I, so both from a funding standpoint and from an operational standpoint, permanent supportive housing for chronically homeless. Right. Uh, it was a very controversial item for several years. And I think the reason it was so controversial is people had this image in their mind of a, of people loitering on the street, right. you know, homeless people lo- loitering on the street. And that's very much not, it's the opposite of what it is. Right. It's, the point is to get them off it's the a house. It's a housing development. It looks right. like any other, I mean, if you've seen Flanagan Landing, it's, it's an elementary school that was redeveloped into housing mm-hmm. in South Knoxville. It's an amazing facility. It's beautiful. And it's a really, it's now an asset to the community. And the folks there aren't homeless. They're, they're, they're house, they're living there. Right. And it has 24 seven staff and it has case management on site. And what it is, if we want to help people and we need to help people, uh, we need to meet some basic needs first. Right. We can't serve folks while they're living under a bridge or even living in a homeless shelter. We need, they need to get in some sort of stable housing, need to get on their med, stay on their meds see counseling, hopefully get them into some sort of productive, productive life. Right. Um, but we've, we've got to treat people with, you know, humanely, but more importantly, well, not more importantly, as importantly, uh, we have a, you know, fiscally it costs, it costs way less to treat somebody in permanent supportive housing than it does the way we're doing it now right. with our jails with and our emergency rooms and all saying, the services. Yeah. So it costs a lot less and it's a better long-term solution. And it's just, it's just the. I think we have a moral obligation to you know, yeah, treat absolutely. people as human beings. So, that, I, there's a lot of that. I think that I just feel. I, feel, I know. I know that issue pretty well. I'm, I feel passionate about it. Uh, I want to. I want to. I want the county. And I, the county has been at the table. And I want to be at the table to help I think, solve I mean, that problem. Not that I'm well versed enough to throw a solution on, but I think um, through talking to the public defenders, the two guys running for public defender's office. Um, I think those what you're talking about in tandem with some of that stuff because I'm sure some of that mess goes to their office too. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And you know, like I'm like I'm I'm so blown away and excited about what our public defender office is. Um, and so as I can, not your constituent because I'm not voting for you because you're not in my district. But I mean that is I that is something that I approve you to vote for an increased funding for. Um, as a as a Knox County resident, I think that's something that. I think that's something that we need to make a bigger point of making sure that we as a public know that the thing exists and what it's doing. I had no idea. Like I literally was reading down the ballot and I was starting to email people like, Hey, come on my show. You're, I get to vote for you. I have no idea what you do. Yeah. And I get Sharif in here and he explains it to me and I'm like, what, this is a real thing. How long have you been doing this? Oh, he retired after 30 years. He's and the this first one. El- right. This election is replacing that guy who was already a legend yeah we need to make a bigger deal about this i don't like i it, it blows my mind that i've lived in knoxville since 94 95 yeah. and so the entire time i've lived here has existed mm-hmm. and i hear about it a week ago yeah and only because it's a special election this time and only because me and three of my buddies well four of my buddies started a stupid podcast 
and we start talking politics and figure why can't we talk to these people? Why can't we learn more about these people? Well, the fact that it's a partisan election is blows my mind, right? Yeah, well, that's something we talked about, and I mean, really, like both of them are like not really. It's just it's it's a county election, so it has to be. be. Yeah, Yeah. same with commission. You know, and it's one of those uh, to be. Again, like that's something that maybe once we get through the last little set of our um, as as many as I can squeeze in before this August sixth, everybody, and early voting starts Friday the seventeenth. Um, but um, I want to get some election commission people in here. That's some stuff that I want to understand more about how and why certain things work. Um, I'm we I personally am a hard argument for I I don't like either of the standard parties as they exist. Um, I don't I think they promote the divisiveness of what politics what people perceive politics to be more than it is what's actually happening um and so i'd like to see if we're going to insist on a party system i want more parties at the table that's my stance on it um but well i'm on record as as being in favor of of county elections being nonpartisan. yeah and i've, I've that's a that's an unpopular uh, stance among the party you know Obviously. and i get that and i respect and i respect that too i really do i, I respect folks that that you know, that want to keep it partisan, uh, and I and I appreciate. I mean, I can see it on some like some I appreciate stuff their sense. arguments on things. They you know they they want to know you know people want to know where I stand on things, and that's fair. I understand. Right, like but, commission commission makes sense to me, like th- 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 on a little bit, a little we bit. We really don't, but the, you know what? There's the, uh, in my experience, and I, I've worked again working there ten years, but even following it since then. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my eighteen years, however long it's been that I've been following county commission, I, I can't think of any party line votes. I just can't, I, you know, because well, I mean, like uh, to in some of the other conversation I, we've had, it's been like, um, I, you know, like the whole the whole metro politi- po- conversation came up and I was talking to Kyle about it. And I t- since I talked to Kyle about it because it came to my head while I was talking to Kyle, I insisted on talking to Todd about it, you know, and both of them had very partisan answers for it. Both right. of them did. <laughs> it was um, Todd was like, well, yeah, if India is the mayor, not Jacobs, then that'd be great. And then Kyle's stance was, well, the, the the way that would most likely go through is that the city would uh, would dissolve itself, and the city's not going to do that because they're all Democrats and they're not going to give it to the Republican county. So and, to and say he's, that he's right, I mean, but, that's how it would be. But I'm just saying, but to say that 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 there isn't part of, there isn't real partisanship here in Knoxville is, is inaccurate from my little little. Uh, there is, there's always part, I think, you know, a lot of our partisanship and really even as a country, it's a lot of it's urban versus rural. Right. That's a lot of our divide right now is For urban sure. and suburban, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, everything's polarized, you know, everything's divisive. And I, for me, right. I, I think I don't see things in a binary context. Right. I mean, and that's, you know, that's something that I'm with too. Like AC, yeah. one of our co-hosts, he has a great line on it where he says, he says, there's a reason why there is a right or wrong, a left or right. A Republican or Democrat. There's a reason there's only two options on those things. And it, it really hit home when we were talking about it because it's me as the libertarian. I'm wrong to both parties because it's me or not me. And that is the stance. And so like I've been trying to push the ideal of government for me, government for government. That's the binary that I'm after mm-hmm. is I want a government that's for me, yeah. not a government that's for itself. And so my binary when I'm talking to people, it's, you know, as much about, as I can. What about can, government for we? Well, I, me is the royal. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> that's the big distinction, though. That's you know, a better way gover- to in libertarian. Right. Yeah, but that's a better that, that that is more accurate. That is that is better phrasing of what my intent was. Yeah. My intent is me as the populace. Right. Right. I think actually the first version of it was government for the citizen versus government for the government's sake. Sure, that's the idea that I'm yeah. after. And so if we're going to insist on a binary, that's the binary yeah. I want to chase down. Yeah, and, and you know, like I, I mean, I don't know. It's just like like I said, like I was getting at is like I, some spots make sense that at least there's a there's a framework in the parties in people's mind whether that's accurate to the individual that is running under that banner is the is probably the bigger problem i think is i think you have i mean i've got um eddie bannis coming on later which running for city mayor was nonpartisan because it's a city election but historically a lot of people kind of look at him more as a democrat than a republican and he's funded some democrat stuff and this that and the other but now he's running as a republican and i'm trying to figure out how to talk to him and not make that insulting when i ask him that question because i'm going to ask because i want to i want to understand the process i don't i don't care about which party you're in because i don't like either party that you are perceived to be in that's just how i am in in in, in my third party stance mm-hmm. and so that's um it's just it's just frustrating and interesting and um it's incredibly frustrating it's been it's been frustrating for me running in a district that's very split mm-hmm. and uh 
again, I, I, I talk to folks about issues. I try to focus on local, you know, relevant local issues. Talk about my platform. Right. You hear you hear about my platform. I'm promoting pro urban. I'm pro mental health. I'm pro schools. Right. You know, people think I'm people think I'm a Democrat. Right. I'm you know, I'm, and then they find out I'm a Republican, and you know, they're depending on what they are, they, their mood changes. Right. And, you know, that's unfortunate because I think at the local level, what's more, it's so important to have people run and come to the table and not, not have all the right answers. Right. You know, the, Be willing the, the to accept Republican that Party don't. does right. not have all the right answers to our, our issues here in Knox County. The Democratic Party does not have all the right answers to the issues we're facing here in Knox County. What gets us to the right answer is, ask, is coming to the table and asking the right questions. Right. Asking the right questions, challenging assumptions, uh, um, listening, listening to one another. Right. I and mean, we don't do that as much as we used to, or I'm not sure we ever did. But, right. Uh, it's, it's, it's a it lost, seems, it's a it lost louder art. now, yeah. Yeah, well, and, and that's what I, I love about local government is that we all come together and we're not, you know, we may be going back to our district, but we all live in the same community. Right. At the state level, you know, you have legislators from Knoxville and then you have legislators from, you know, White Pine and, you know, Murfreesboro and right. Mem- Memphis, you know, they can, they can argue and they can be partisan because they just go back to their, their own district. They right. don't have, you know, they're, they're not as accountable to, to the collective community, right. the, the collective state. And, uh, and same with obviously in Congress, right? Right. For uh, sure. You know, they, they, Nancy Pelosi and, and Mitch McConnell, well, they can just point fingers at each other and they can go back to their safe gerrymandered district and, right. and get reelected for 40 years. <laughs> and that's, you know, so for me, it's funny when I talk to folks, you know, the, the most bipartisan issue I, I like to bring up to bring people together, whether, it, you know, whether I'm talking to a, a staunch Republican or, or a hardcore, uh, liberal, uh, Democrat is term limits. Right. It's something I am, I feel like, I feel like a single issue voter now. There's a lot of single issue voters out there, right? Yeah. You know, pro-life, mm-hmm. uh, pro-gun, you know, whatever it may be. There's right. a lot of pe- people who just are focused on one issue and that's, that's their litmus test right. to, for a candidate. For me at the state and federal level, it's term limits. Really? And I, and I wish it worked I, for everybody. You, you got the one guy in the show who was not, who was who was not a fan of the term limit. You're not you're not a fan of term limits. It's it, it, it I it I get the premise behind it. I acknowledge it. I'm not a, I'm not totally opposed to it. It's not like it's it's not a single issue to me to put uh-huh. it in those terms. But for me, it's 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 a refre- it's a reflection of us societally that we don't put forth the effort. I've I'm totally mm-hmm. if we could figure out the 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 gerrymandering issue. And we, and and continue term limits. Would, see, that's my that's my argument for term limits. Okay. Is that I think it would, I think it solves. I think there's a ripple effect of a lot of other really big systemic issues in our in our country, in our state, in our country. Is I think it it, it deals with money in mm-hmm. politics, right? But people on both sides frustrated with money and the, the the power of the incumbency. There's so much power in the incumbency, sure. and a lot of it revolves around monies, uh, the money. Uh, so it, it takes a lot of the money out, right? It. It, See, I don't know. I, the that's part of my of argument. Districts, but, right. The gerrymandering of districts. It, that one for sure. It's done so to preserve right. preserve your legacy, right? right? Preserve your your lifelong seat. Right. That and, one, like, I feel like just do like school zones, like something like that, like schools, like like put something that's already that's simply on the map that makes sense. Yeah. That isn't some like that. I don't know how to fix that one. I don't know if we as a citizenry can can make that a, a federal ballot item to force a repair to that. But that one I agree with. I'm t- yeah, like that one I'm I, totally down with. But for me, it's it's. I don't think it changes my my argument. At least is I don't think it changes the money. I think it's just it changes the. It'll it'll it, it it's just gonna it's gonna be so for lack of a better way to put it, it'd be if you continue down this road, right? If you continue into politics, you decide you really like it. You get into mayor, you go to state. Doesn't sound like that's that's on your agenda list. That was gonna that's a future question I was gonna ask yeah. anyway because I always we'll talk about do that it. too. But um, you know, so it's um. To me, it's just it's just it, it, if if the money's the issue, the people that play the money games just groom. They they groom differently than they groom now. I don't think it changes it. I think for lack of a better way to put it, you're going to take a, a blue bodysuit and fill it with a different one that's already paid for. I don't think that cha- that 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 part of the 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 the, the term limit arguments. I, I'm not well. It may fully it, behind. It, it, you know, it, well. If anything, it makes it, it cheaper to for say the buyer. It, to say it takes all the money out is not is is not accurate. I mean, there's still going to be money involved and influence, but at the end of the day, it weakens it. Right. And more importantly, it it creates a it creates a context of political will. Right. 
in that I'm making this decision not based on getting reelected. I'm not doing just what is right, but the politically inverse. Pal palatable decision. Right. I'm doing what is the right thing to do. Right. So when we talk about, you know, the biggest issue that gets brought up in, in both, you know, Congress, you know, gets up every year is Social Security and, right. you know, entitlements. Right. That's the, most of our federal budget is entitlements, right? right. And they don't, but none, of, none of it ever gets touched. Right. And it, by either party. Right. Because they, it won't get them reelected. Right. And I think it creates a little bit of political will. And here's the thing. I, I'm all for the institutional knowledge. You know, that's the argument I hear is that, you know, term limits takes away a lot of that institutional knowledge. I'm like, well, maybe there's too much institutional knowledge. Yeah, see, I don't, I, 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 <laughs> um, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm here or there on that, but I think it's, I think my argument, at least on, on a base level, and this is part of why I'm doing this is that it's my responsibility to get up there and do something about it. The gerrymander is something I can't fix directly. And that is, a, that is a huge problem for me. But I think if the, the idea that what it, McConnell's out of Kentucky or whatever, that's that, that same district in Kentucky keeps voting him back in and keeps voting back in because they can't produce a better Republican out of that district than him. I mean, it's the same thing with the president's race right now. This is literally the best we've got. I don't know what fucking planet <laughs> that these two individuals are the best possible options that we have in this country. There's no way. I could fart a better option than either one of those, <laughs> to be honest. I'm sorry, it got gross here late. Sorry, everybody. Okay. Um, but I mean, just saying, like, that, that's, the, and, you know, and it, at least, it, it, and not to be a Trump supporter, but at least Trump has the the, the premise of not being a long-term paid uh, government official, whether, you know, he's definitely been a politician his whole life, even though he hasn't been in politics. Um, but I mean, Biden, for all intents and purposes, he's just a bodysuit with a D next to his name. And I think going back to the more local version of why I think it's, we're comfortable with it as a citizenry existing. I think there's, there's, it is complicated stuff that most people don't have the time or energy to keep up with. And that little RD is, is, is the simple lazy way to go. Well, most of the things that these R's do I'm down with, or most of these things yeah. that these D's do that sure. I'm down with. And I, and I get that as a premise and I don't know how to solve that one because literally it took me and my friends making a podcast <laughs> to get me past that yeah. and to get me more involved in it. And I'm hoping that I can help other people yeah. with that through this. I don't have the answers to it. All I can say is, you know, I think, you know, again, the term limits, I, I come back to that because again, it's not perfect, but right. I think it, I think it has a big impact. And I think it's something if you put on the ballot it would have 80% approval. I think you're right. I absolutely so, agree. And I probably vote for it too. I think, honestly, I think and, 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 and you know, even if it's a, uh, a, a nine year, you know, three, three year terms or whatever it may be. I mean, I'm not yeah. saying like two, you know, four years or whatever, but see, my argument is always, if we're going to do it, let's do a full political one. So you can do 20 years in politics, period. I like that yeah. one better, but well, that's a separate thing. We don't yeah, have to go you know, there. There's some, yeah, there's some, yeah, there's some free first amendment, uh, you know, uh, uh, civil liberties, I guess you could, you could argue that people have a right to run for office, but nonetheless, I, I think that is a big, a big issue. It's fortunately not an issue for County commission. We are already term limited to two right. terms. I'm, I'm supportive of that. See, for me, uh, you know, running, do, running for County commission, uh, it's not a hobby. Like I'm not doing this for fun on the side, uh, for for ego or for recognition. Uh, it's public service, but it's also so it's not a hobby, but it's also not a career for me. Right. Like I have a career. I have a four year old and a six year old. Okay, to pause it for a second yeah. to officially ask the question, because that's what I was hinting sure. at, and that's you're answering the question I didn't yeah. officially ask yet. Is that do you see yourself continuing in politics? I, I in the near term. Absolutely not. I'm, I'm looking at four years mm -hmm. as a county commissioner. And at the end of four years, we'll re I'll reevaluate with my wife, my family, and see what kind of impact it's having on my family. Of course, what kind of impact it's having on my my job, and my career. Maybe another four years. At that point, you know, eight years from now, again, best. That's assuming I, I were to serve two full terms. Um, I would. Uh, my my youngest will be entering middle school. My oldest will be entering high school. Great time to. To kick, step back, to step back, and and to and kick back and go be, back, be around the, for my family, you know, go be, back in the private sector and be way busier. Well, it's not a full time job, so right. I'm I'm, I'm going to continue working. I'm right. going to continue raising my kids, and you know, it's a, it's a it's a demanding job, but it's not. And again, it's a job I feel really prepared to do on day one. There's not going to be any learning curve right. for me. I'm ready. I know the budget inside and out. I know the departments. I know the players, and I'm that's why I'm running. I want to get. I just want to. I want to be effective. I want to get some things done in my district. I want to expand our urban wilderness to, to North Knoxville. I want, I want more mountain bike trails in, in North Knox. I want, you know, more redevelopment along our major corridors. I want, you know, good school, good outcomes in our schools and our inner city. 
and I, I have some ideas on how, how we can get those things done. I, I think I know how to, I think I, I hopefully can be persuasive to my, my friends and colleagues on county commission and city council and enjoy good relationships on both sides of the aisle to do that. So that's, that's what's that's that's the the passion that I'm bringing. And I like it. Uh, I mean, I'm you, you know, I, I like the I like the experience there. I think you're. I mean, yeah. I think you're well positioned to do what you're talking about. So, we're gonna close out with the official question that is not my question. This is the Max question. Um, Max is right now fighting with his neighbors because his neighbors keep calling the county on him because he has too much crap in his yard. <laughs> um, and in fairness, Max, I know you probably won't listen because you never listen to shows that you're not in. Um, so I'll call you out officially. His yard is pretty junky. It's it's real. But um, at the end of the day, the libertarian here is like, it's my yard. Leave me alone. Um, you know, his big thing is um, he uh, he has a 18, 16 year old. Um, he and his wife, he has his everyday vehicle and he has a toy car. He got a 61 Willie Jeep. Mm. Things oh, fun. cool. Yeah. Just got it. He's still working on it, but it's tagged and it runs. Yeah. He just has a couple of things to do to make it you know safe on the road kind of deal um his wife has her daily car and then she has a toy car which is this weird little mazda pickup truck like uh, right side drive and everything huh. um and then he has a camper and, and he had two boats for a little while and that was one of the ones he was cited for because he had two boats both worked um you know and he has an outbuilding and so all this other different stuff and he's got a huge yard and he's it's always like you know i don't i mean and i've had issues here in the house too and it's like one of those it just seems like it's you just get a pissy neighbor and you got to deal with it and you get a $1,500 fine from the county if you don't fix it the way they want it or something of that nature it depends on I don't remember the whole specifics it's his story but I mean essentially I think it's I think it's BS I think you it's my yard leave me alone because the argument's always it's it ruins property value and I don't know if I believe that um so really it's just a you as my neighbor don't like looking at it so you're complaining about it and so the county is doing the legwork that you as the neighbor don't want to confront me about that's my argu- my argument on his story. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I don't know, we always bring that up because almost everybody goes, like, I don't know, it's actually uh, probably 70% of the, the uh, candidates we've talked to about it. It's like, well, that seems kind of weird. Nobody else got the story that it is kind of dumpy that I threw on top of that. But um, <laughs> everybody else pitch- everybody else he pitches it to. I just have, he's got a lot of stuff. He, he just has sure. a lot of stuff. He's a lot of stuff guy. He lives in the county, not in the city. He, he feels like he he's not violating anybody's rights or anything he's not his crap's not rolling off in other people's yards and so we always have this one and for me i always ask the question where is the charter like where can i find the charter where i can read these bylaws that he is breaking sure that's um, the one that i want to know and then oh yeah. you can answer whatever you want to answer uh, to him because he's I, not here at, at the I, I i can't cite to you the actual the exact code number but I, I certainly know where it is we have dirty lot ordinance that's what it's called right uh and then we also have zoning we have zoning regulations, right? And in our zoning regulations, it regulates. But know, is that like on the county website? Can I pull that up through the yeah, county? Yeah, and there's we have inoperable vehicles. Uh, that those are those are mentioned in our, our right. county codes. Yes, yeah, so you go to municode.com. Uh, go to the county's website. I'm sure, hopefully they have some link to it. If not, follow up with me. I can tell you where to find <laughs> okay. it. Because I, I I ran this. I right, ran, that's I ran like, that department right, yeah, right. actually, and so I, you know, I I was the department head that had to go and enforce. Right. Our blighted properties, our junk, the junk car, junk car lots, and things like that. I will say, you know, from what you're describing, that's a that's a typical a typical complaint we would get. Right. Um, and yeah, it's complaint driven. You know, county doesn't drive around looking for violations. It's something that absolutely is right. Complaint a neighbor, a complaint from a neighbor. Right. Um, and we do have a code. We have codes on the books for that deal with a lot of its health, safety, welfare type stuff. You know, so if you got it, you know, if you have. 10 and we've had situations 20 25 junk cars mm-hmm. piled up in a in a you know that's an environmental issue there's some there are prop you know it does it does detract from property values as a community i mean we have community standards we all kind of live up to now is it as it's not as strict as like an hoa you live in a homeowners association right. there's you can't but, you gotta pay but your that's, vol- that's voluntary so that's it's, different to me well so. we, you know but we all live we all have social con- con- constructs we live in right and um now again if if it meets the letter of the law, the, the vehicles run, the the I don't know how that how I can't remember the rules on the boats and RVs, but usually I mean, they just have to be parked behind the building line. Usually, but was, from what um, from from what from what he mentioned in the in the actual paperwork is that his understanding from either the paperwork or talking to somebody that you used to work with essentially was that it's, it's two boats that are visible from the street. Period. Yeah, you may or actually. Not, you I'm sorry, it was two one. trailers. 
So if it's uh, a that's right, yeah. So if it's a accessory, if, yeah, it's a right. Yeah, so if trailer. he so if he had like um, I don't know if he had like a a building a, a contractor, like if he was a contractor and had a, a, a his tools in a trailer, and then he has a boat on a trailer, that's a violation of the, yeah. of the county code. So yeah, he 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 may need to get a build a garage or you know put something. Yeah, I think depending on where his zone, if what kind of zoning. What zone know, he lives in? If he lives in ag, now there's difference where you live in an ag zone. You live in a, right. if you live in a residential zone, yeah, there's zoning. There's zoning requirements it's right. Right. Um, that 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 apply. But you know, I think I mean at least when I was over codes, I tried to apply common sense as best I could. Right. You know, it's tough though. You know, we we as government, putting my my hat on when I was code enforcement director, we're often put in the middle of neighborhood disputes of neighbor right. neighbor disputes and. Uh, you know, we were, there was one instance where uh, uh, it was in an ag zone, and neighbors got crossways with each other, and but it's because it was in an ag zone, the guy got a bunch of pigs, put them in his backyard, mm-hmm. and it was totally legal. Right now, it violated some HOA requirements, but those are outside of the county's yeah, enforced true. HOA. But anyway, you know, it's we run in, we would run into those situations from time to time, and that's you know, when you buy your property, you know what you need to know what zone you live in and what you're allowed to do in that zone. And, right. He may not be allowed to have, yeah, four trailers out there. And if so, you know, find a way to accommodate, you know, get, right. get them out of sight or build a build a garage, put them in a garage or put them in a, you know, put them. Yeah, because there was some issue with else. the building. He put, he dropped a building, but that's their separate issue. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, again, I, at the end of the day, it's it's difficult to enforce. Right. Uh, you know, it don't, we, we usually only go to that drastic measure of enforcement where we're citing to court. Very, very seldom did, would we do that. I'm, I'm sure it's the same now. We try not to. We try to work it out in a reasonable way and you right. know, give time. And to where we actually write citations, it, it it takes a lot to get to that point. I know person. I know from experience. Right. And uh, we've done it. We've had to do it a few times. But um, it's it's not an easy job from from the government standpoint. But you, know, you try to apply common sense and and be reasonable with folks and uh, work out compromise. Okay. Um, that's all. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure there's a mountain of questions I forgot to ask, but, um, give your, your list of things, uh, your website, your contact information, people will get a hold of you. Um, and then whatever you'd like to close with and I'll do my quick close and yeah. we'll call it a show. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate the time. Appreciate you having me on and I appreciate folks who are listening and, and paying attention to the race. Uh, please look me up. My, my website is just grant for commission.com. My, uh, email address is grantforcommission at gmail.com. My phone number is 865-207-5828. That's my, my mobile number. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. So a lot of ways to uh, to, to learn more about me and look look me up and, and get, in, get in touch. But, you know, I would appreciate anyone who's listening who lives in North Knox, Fountain City area to give me an opportunity to earn their vote. And uh, early voting starts this Friday, the right, 7th, Friday 17th. Friday the 17th. And... Uh, election day is August 6th, so get out and vote uh, and pay attention to your local races. It's the most important. It's the most important form of government is our local government. Absolutely, that's that. That is essentially the only reason we're doing this right now is because I've argued it to death for years. We argued it on the regular podcast, and then I said, "Hey, what? Why not? We can start talking to people." We are almost in agreement. Um, this has been a special interview episode. Um, this will release tonight. Um, we are almost in agreement at gmail.com. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on all your podcast services. Uh, give us a like and a share, five-star reviews, all that good stuff. Um, we want to keep doing this for, for more and more people. We're going to kind of refocus after the August 6th election set so that we can start working into the November stuff. And then I really want to start pulling in some non-race, um, uh, non-candidate race kind of issues, trying to bring in some people back that we've talked to after they win their elections and stuff like that and kind of check in to see what's happening. I'm really hot to get some school board people in here um, but I understand that right now is probably not the greatest time. They're probably a little busy. <laughs> so this is our special episode, and we appreciate y'all listening. Uh, we got two more to record today, so we're going to cut it off here. Have a great day.